Welcome, everybody, to Firehouse Talks with Jersey Rick, Igniting Leadership Excellence. I'm Rick, and this is my co-host, Emily. Today, this is episode number four, The Williams Street Fire. Episode number three, we talked about communications, the importance of communications, barriers to communications, and the importance of connecting. Emily, do you have anything to add about that particular episode before we move on and pick up and continue with that a little bit? I don't think so, except I just encourage those that haven't listened to episode three yet to go check it out first of how we discuss communications and the breakdowns with it and why communication is so important in today's world. Okay. All right. Thank you, Emily. Mm -hmm. So let's jump right on in. So the William Street Fire is today's episode title. So what is the William Street Fire <laughs> and what does that have to do with communication? The William Street Fire is an incident that I responded to when I was a firefighter in the Air Force. It occurred one afternoon shortly after lunchtime. Now, we didn't have 911. We had 117. When people would dial 117, it would ring into the alarm room and it would be broadcast over the station's PA system. Hmm. So we had just wrapped up lunch. We were taking care of things, cleaning up, getting ready uh, to jump into the afternoon's activities. When you knew when 117 was ringing because there was a little click over the PA system. Alarm room operator picked up, said, fire department, what's your emergency? And this woman was screaming into the phone, my house is on fire, and, you know, and gave the address in the 500 block of Williams Street. Now, this was in base housing, military base housing. We had a lot of aircraft incidents. We had a lot of what we called smells and bells, a lot of incidents that we respond to because somebody was smelling something or an alarm was going off. Then we didn't get a lot of structure fires. So this woman screaming, our house is on fire in base housing on William Street and the 500 block. I knew exactly where that was because one of the men on our shift, whose last name was Williams, lived on Williams Street, <laughs> base housing, That's in the 400 funny. block. And he and his wife would have me over quite a bit to eat supper with them, spend time with them, play games with them and their kids. So I knew exactly where we were going. And that day, I was driving the assistant chief, which the assistant chief was the shift commander. So on this assignment, it was the assistant chief, the rescue truck, first due engine, and a second due engine. Mm -hmm. Hopped in the pickup truck. The assistant chief got in, and we took off. We're heading over there. Like I said, I knew exactly where we were going to. Pulled into the main entrance to base housing, and I'm getting ready to make my right-hand turn to go south because that's where the 500 block was. And then all of a sudden, the assistant chief is yelling, no, 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 you idiot. Turn left. Turn left, you idiot. Like, number one, I don't like being called an idiot. Number two, I know where the fire is yeah. because I know where the 500 block is. So number three, it's like, okay, we're going to find out who the idiot is. I turn left and go north like he's yelling at me to do. Well, guess what? The rescue truck and the engine, they go south like they're supposed to. Wow. I'm looking in the rearview mirror, and I can see the fire blowing out the front windows of this house and two people laying out on the front lawn. And then he starts yelling again, where are those idiots gone? Where are those idiots gone? And I just said, hey, chief, they're going to the fire. It's behind us. And they say, turn it around, turn it around. Like, yeah, no fooling. <laughs> no. So I wow. turned, turned the vehicle around. I went back up to where we were supposed to be the first time where I knew where we were going to in the 500 block of Williams Street. Yeah. The guys made a, a real quick stop. So that is mm -hmm. the Williams Street Fire down the street from my friend Williams. That's so interesting. So why do you think the assistant chief called you an idiot and ordered you to turn the wrong direction? Well, he was an interesting sort. 
Sounds like it. <laughs> <laughs> he had spent 20 years on active duty and, and an explanation should be here uh, for those who are not familiar with uh, the Department of Defense uh, Fire Department structure is in a lot of places, it's a mixture of military and civilian firefighters. Mm. And that's what we had at Seymour Johnson Air Force Base in North Carolina was a mixture of military and civilian firefighters. And the assistant chief was a civilian firefighter. However, he had spent 20 years on active duty in the Air Force, had retired from the Air Force, and then got the job with civil service. So he had seen a lot. He'd experienced a lot. He knew a lot. He was a he was a man of a lot of information and, and great wealth. And, and I learned a lot from him when it was yeah. my turn to drive. It was a great learning experience for picking things up from him, mm -hmm. even though it's like, okay, I prefer to be on the engine. You know, I would have much rather have been on the engine that day, you know, being one of the firefighters attacking the fire than being yelled at and being called an idiot you know, for where I knew was happening. Plus, it's just uncalled for. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. So I, I look back at, you know, the era that he grew up in, the system that he grew up in. Uh, he had been over in Vietnam, you know, mm -hmm. as a firefighter, and we'd seen a lot of action there. So I, I think when you take into account, you know, why does somebody call someone else an idiot when they're yelling and screaming? I look at their background. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How were, let's, we talked about in a couple episodes ago, the home. Yeah. How were they raised in the home? You know, were they called an idiot? Yeah. Well, uh, what were they exposed to? Or, you know, it's like when you start calling somebody an idiot or a moron or a dummy, a knucklehead and things like that, and you keep getting away with it, then it becomes ingrained. Habit. Yep. Habit. Yeah. It becomes ingrained in you. So I certainly don't know the psychological reasons behind why everything was going on as to why he was calling me an, an idiot. But that that's what I suspect. Did he ever apologize to you? Like, or say like you were right, I was accept that he was wrong? No. Huh. No, he never apologized. He never said that he was wrong. He never said that I was right. Huh. Um. We had a very interesting conversation, minus the assistant chief. <laughs> we got back yeah, to I'm the sure. station. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, the first question came up from uh, my friend whose last name was Williams, who was on the rescue truck that day, who he knew where he was going. And he asked me, he said, uh, mm -hmm. why, did, why did you make the wrong turn? And I said, I didn't make the wrong turn. This is what happened as he was yelling at me, of calling course. me an idiot and telling me to turn that direction. Yeah. And his response was, and the response of the other guys was, well, figures, sounds like him. Wow. <laughs> That's really interesting. So it sounds like he had like a reputation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In a bad way. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. So did it ever happen again with that individual? No, no. He never told mm -hmm. me how to drive That's again. Good. He never told me where to go. Again, in the military, it's pretty simple to find where you're going to. Base housing, the streets have names, mm. but up on the main side base, everything's numbered. Yeah, so you, okay. you you could have, for example, you might be responding to uh, the lawn and garden shop and it's building 930. Well, it's in the 900 area. So you already have a pretty good idea of where it is. But we had a big map of the uh, base as well with fire hydrants that were identified on there. You know, it was a lot mm -hmm. different than what it is today. Whereas in my command vehicle responding as a battalion chief and also in the rigs, you know, we had computers, mobile data terminals. So the incident would pop up and you could bring up the map and the map shows where the fire hydrants are at. And there's also a routing feature for those who like to use the routing feature and they, they push the button. I didn't like that feature. I like looking at the map, knowing where I was going to go ahead of time. And I, I didn't want that thing talking to me. So yeah. <laughs> kind of a little <laughs> off topic there, but no, he never said anything again. Huh. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. So do you have another example from your career as a firefighter when communication was a problem? <laughs> communication was a problem in a lot of a lot of incidents, but sure. one that you know really comes to mind, and it was at a time when 
Hey, hey, frankly, uh, we went through a period of time at Loveland Fire Rescue where there was a lot of organizational chaos mm -hmm. that was taking place. And this particular incident occurred, it was either late January or early February. It was early in the morning, somewhere was between two and three o'clock in the morning. We were dispatched to a residential structure fire. I was a lieutenant on engine five up on the north end of town. And my driver that day was uh, working overtime from another shift. He was covering on a fill shift. So we were first due on this fire. And as we came down the street, you could see it. I mean, it was it was blowing out the windows in this one particular house. So we pulled up, and ice and snow was out there, stretched the first line and started to attack the fire. Second due engine showed up hmm. and you know, we had a few volunteer fire chiefs at that period of time and they started showing up and there was no command structure that was solidified there we had everybody with a white helmet including the paid fire chief who showed up as well and a paid division chief who showed up and everybody with a white helmet was giving an order so you had conflicting orders that were taking place oh, wow. all the way throughout the fire ground and later on after everything was said and done talking to the other crews that were on scene listening to them it's like what fire were you on <laughs> <laughs> you know so that it was just this tremendous breakdown in communication yeah that was taking place there and something that's so important and it comes to an emergency scene that lives are involved and yeah, mm -hmm. that's bad. Yes, you're right. So what is the remedy for that type of chaos? Because I mean, that sounds incredibly chaotic. Yeah, the remedy for that type of chaos in a, in a fire scene or, or any type of emergency scene is one incident commander. One incident commander who has the ability to command and control yeah. the incident scene. <clears throat> Pardon me. Someone who has command presence. They know what they're doing. They know what they're talking about. And they have the ability to remain calm, cool, and collected, talking on the radio so everybody can understand them. Mm -hmm. Nothing like some of these stupid shows that are on TV now, you know, where everybody's running around screaming and things. All chaotic. Yeah, yeah. all chaotic and, you know, and things like that. It's, it's our job to bring the calm to that chaos yeah. Yeah. that is on scene. The order. So, yeah, the order. Exactly. So one incident commander one person in charge now that doesn't mean that you can't have a command team which is what ultimately we move to and we we function with in a command team for instance on that same fire that i just described if we were using the same system that we had started using in 2009 and i was the battalion chief was mm -hmm. showing up well first due engine would have taken command and then when i show up they would have transferred command back out to me mm. and then another individual would have got in the vehicle with me as my support officer i would have handed them my tactical worksheet and they're taking care of that and that allows me to better concentrate on the radio traffic and to watch what is happening outside the windows and make tactical decisions so nobody's getting hurt or killed and it comes under now what's referred to as span of control. You not only have mm -hmm. one incident commander, but then there's a span of control, meaning that you only have a certain number of people that are reporting to you. So for the folks who are listening or who are watching that are not involved in the fire service, when all the resources were showing up, all of our people had radios. Not everybody was calling me on the radio. That just creates more chaos. Yeah. So I would divide up the incident into groups. And then those group supervisors or division supervisors, depending on the type of incident, they are the only ones that were calling me back on the radio. And I wasn't calling any of their firefighters on the radio. That was up to them, those division or group supervisors, strike team leaders, task force leaders, to communicate with the people that were assigned to them. Mm. That is the type of system. Mm -hmm. And earlier in our episodes, episode number one, I believe it was, 
or maybe even number two, where we talked about the difference between management and leadership. Yeah. And that management is systems and processes. Yeah. And the incident command system is a process. And when it is followed, you know, and, and I know there's probably some people going to be listening to this or in the fire world that say, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know that stuff. Yeah, well, that works. <laughs> and I know it works because I spent 37 years doing, doing the job. And you have to have a system in place yeah. to remedy that chaos so you could clearly communicate with people. And Emily, the other thing hmm. with this ability to clearly communicate with people, it's a safety issue. Yeah. It's a it's I definitely thinking about that. Yes, it's definitely a safety issue. When you have every Tom, Dick, and Harry, Betty, Sue, and Jane out there on the radio and they're talking on the radio and yakking back and forth and so forth like that and then something happens it's a may day somebody's falling through the floor they falling through the roof falling into a hole something like that you know the may day may not go out because so many people are yakking 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 on the radio and the other thing mm -hmm. that comes into play too it's referred to as auditory exclusion hmm. where people are they think it's communicating but where they're just gabbing 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 so much on the radio that people shut them out oh yeah, yeah. and that's auditory exclusion so they mm -hmm. can miss critical radio traffic yeah. that needs to happen so so hello. in this yeah in this situation it really has to be clear and concise communication yeah, it has to be clear and concise communication now we've been talking about what's happened on two different incidents you know, a fire at Seymour Johnson and a fire in North Loveland. But how many organizations that are not involved in emergency response, they experience the same thing. Oh yeah. 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 I, I think I think you worked for one of them a few years back that where communication might have been an issue. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it so communications issues. Like I said, it doesn't have to be a fire. It happens yeah. within families, Absolutely. within the home, within the, the house. You know, it happens in businesses and so forth like that. And, you know, and, and then there's chaos, mm -hmm. you know, that occurs. And then coming back to the span of control issue. I remember when, you know, Rebecca, who's our other daughter, she worked at a place where one supervisor had 27 people reporting to her. You cannot effectively lead 27 people. Yeah. That is chaos. Yeah. And then there's a breakdown in communication because some people will get the information and others won't. And as I said in the previous episode, when we delved into communication, people will start to make up stories. Yeah. Well, I didn't hear it that way. Huh. Well, maybe I didn't hear it that way. Or it's like, no, that's that's the way it is. You didn't hear it right. And it gets jumbled up and it, it's like a puzzle that yeah. you tear apart and you put all the pieces in a box and you you shake it up and there's no there's no clear picture that's there with that. Yeah. That's a good example of jumbling up a puzzle. Thank you. Yeah. So um, you talked about practicing. Did we talk about practicing closing the communication loop? No, we did not. That is a practice that we began engaging in in 2009 as well. And what does that mean? Closing the communications loop. What the, it's, it's very simple. And that's just acknowledging what was said. Not Roger, 10-4, copy, okay. It's, you know, acknowledging back what they just said and, and not long conversations over the radio. You know, for example, when I showed up on scene as the battalion chief and getting ready to take command, if it was something that I needed to take command for, something because yeah. a lot of times it's like there, there was no need, you know, the first two incident commander was doing a fine job and it was, uh, it was an incident that wasn't complex enough, but they would tell me, you know, what they had, what they were doing, what they needed. And, you know, if the incident or excuse me, like when they're passing command, you know, and I say, I'm ready to take command. 
they'd say, okay, you know, battalion one, it, we got the two story structure, which, yeah, we saw that, but uh, hey, we have fire in the second floor on the Alpha Delta corner. We got the green attack line, make an interior. The tower is taking care of utilities and the rescue is conducting search and rescue. And I just repeat that back. Okay, understand fire, second floor, Alpha Delta corner. You've stretched the green line. Tower's taking care of utilities. Rescue's conducting search and rescue. That is co closing the communications loop mm -hmm. because it might have been something that the other person said. And when I repeat it back, I might have missed it. And there are also times that I say, there's one piece that I missed, and they get that. That's closing that communications loop. Because when you just say, okay, copy that, mm -hmm. or they or I said something on the radio and they said copy, how do I know that they truly understood? Now, right. we're communications on the fire ground is not like this. Because the people that are communicating with me so many times, or I'm communicating with them, they're wearing a self-contained breathing apparatus and a face mask. And so sometimes the communicators are going, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> and if I said, copy, <laughs> what, what did I copy? Right. So that's, that's closing the communications loop. That's something that could be practiced in our everyday communications yeah. with other people. Well, I was thinking that it's mm -hmm. even just as simple as someone at the drive-thru repeating your order back to you, mm -hmm. which they really should do because a lot of times they hear it completely, totally wrong. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So like that like example that, yeah. I gave in the uh, previous segment, yeah, uh, episode number three about the drive-in where I ordered custard mm -hmm. and the guy mm -hmm. asked if I wanted mustard and onions yeah. on it. No, no, no pal. I don't generally put mustard and onions on my custard. No, I wouldn't <laughs> suggest that. <laughs> okay, so let's, Um, I think we've touched on this slightly, but let's dive deep more into what, describe the consequences of poor communication during an emergency. Uh, somebody can get seriously hurt or killed. Yeah. Critical information is missed and something will go wrong or it could go wrong. Orders are not followed correctly. The wrong tactics can be engaged because there's miscommunication yeah. that has taken place. Somebody could wind up missing, which will then lead to a mayday because of misunderstood communications. Mm. I mean, I, I, read, I read these reports, line of duty death reports that come out uh, reports that come out from the uh, the wildland world, so forth, like that, and you know miscommunications can uh, lead to a a tragedy fire, and that's something that you know we wanted to avoid. We want to avoid, you know, in the fire service. Yeah, absolutely. So, what happens in a non-emergency situation where there is poor communication? People get mad. Mm. Oh, so, I've uh, experienced that. Yeah. yeah. That's not what you First said enough. to me. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't hear it. I didn't hear it that way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And frustration levels start to creep up. And what happens when frustration levels start to creep up? I think it creates like a hormone response in you and you start getting angry and mm. uh, it depends on what your fight or flight response is. <laughs> right. Some people fight and other people just freeze. I'm the freeze person. <laughs> and so when that happens, when you go into a freeze mode, are you listening to what's being said? No, you're stuck in your head. Like, did I tell them that? Did I not tell them that? Did I dream that I told them that? <laughs> it's a terrible cycle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, it, it is. And for communications it's human behavior and we need to understand these things and as yeah. i said and emily said in one of the previous episodes you know firehouse talks with jersey rick is everything leadership we're talking leadership and communications is a part of leadership and listen it doesn't do any good that when we communicate with somebody that we've we've put them in that fight flight or freeze mode and they're yeah. not listening to us. Now, they'll listen. 
you know, I'm I'm not a you know touchy feely type type guy. One of those things. Yeah. But there are elements to leadership that require communication skills that are good. Absolutely. It's, you know, a lot of people think that on the fire ground, and I'll tie this in here to what you're saying, is do this, do that, blah, 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 blah. No, I, I had a team. And when I broke it up and they, into either groups or divisions and I was communicating with them, they are seeing things that I could not see. Mm -hmm. When they're inside the building, I don't have vision that can see through the walls to what's going on. So you're so, trusting their judgment. Absolutely. Hey, yeah. doesn't that tie back to episode number two? Integrity, yeah. integrity, credibility, and trust. And trust. Yes. Yeah. Tr I am trusting their judgment on what they are seeing. And also they're trusting my judgment because I'm seeing what's happening on the outside that they can't see. Mm -hmm. And on a wildland fire, you know, I sure enough can't see, you know, up over the other side of the ridge when people have dropped down over that. And so, you know, there, there's that trust that comes back and that joint communication that is taking place. Yeah. But it's amazing to me, though, listening to some of the other people that I work with throughout the years, that they function very well in that environment. But then they'd come back to work and they'd tell me the problems that they had at home. Mm -hmm. They couldn't communicate with their, their wife or the wife couldn't communicate with her husband. Yeah. And it's like some, sometimes I was just astounded and, and dumbfounded over, you know, that type of stuff happening. It's like, how come you can communicate with us, but you can't communicate in the house? You know, or they go in and, you know, and, you know, there's, there's arguments and, you know, things such as that happening. Uh, communication is such a vital element into leadership. It's part of human behavior yeah. and we got to put time into it. It's a skill. It's a skill yeah, like no. anything else. Yes. Yeah. You know, you have to learn how to drive the car to get out on the street, to be a safe, efficient and a proficient driver. And communication mm -hmm. is exactly the same thing as well. You know, where are you getting your communications training from? Yeah. You know, if you're listening to some radio program or some music or you know some of these people out here that claim to be musicians <laughs> and and all their stuff is is just profanity laced yeah you know, hey that's not communication that's what's going to be in your head that's what's going to be hey and listen i'm going to tell you this if every other word that you're using is profanity and the f-bomb you might think you're communicating but it's not effective not communication okay. it is not intelligent communication and don't some of you guys that are listening to this well yeah davis that's the way it is in the firehouse you were there for 37 years you know yeah i know how life is in the firehouse and i know that you can can communicate in an intelligent manner to where you can find other words that don't be on that excuse me that don't begin with an f Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you can do that. You could put some effort into that. Matter of fact, related to that, I had a lieutenant on my shift for a couple of years and he had a guy, his firefighter, he couldn't hardly speak three words without dropping the F-bomb. Wow. So the lieutenant created a system and said, every time you use the F word, go to the dictionary and find another word. <laughs> And I saw a change in that firefighter's ability to communicate with people. Wow. Because when you're out there dropping the F-bomb all the time in the fire station, sooner or later, it's going to happen when you've got civilians in the firehouse. Mm -hmm. Sooner or later, it's going to happen when you're in the presence of people that are elected or appointed, you know, whether, whether they're people from your district or your city, or when you've got some congressional person visiting you know if that's how you talk all the time then it's going to come out like that and they're going to walk away and say wow what a bunch of idiots these, these people that they don't they even know how to talk talk to people yeah and you definitely still have to have a level of professionalism even in the fire department mm -hmm. yes but i would go going back to that um 
an example you use of that guy on your shift who couldn't communicate with his wife. I think with communication, you have to adapt depending on your situation. So in his case, maybe he was really good on thinking on the spot and in pressure situations like incident um, command mm -hmm. um, incidents. But then when it comes home, you're just kind of like frozen. <laughs> so I think with communication, like you definitely, it's a learned, it's a learned skill mm -hmm. and you have to learn how to communicate differently with people and mm -hmm. each situation will be different as well. Yeah, absolutely. How many times did you hear throughout the years after I came off of the you know, working a set of shifts or even after a shift in the firehouse? Mm -hmm. where mom would say he's still in the firehouse a lot <laughs> a lot and, and hey folks i was at, i was not coming home and using profanity or cursing at my family and yelling at my family no. it's just that mode that we get in in the firehouse that, that like could, pressure mode yeah the high pressure the hypervigilance yeah you know we're that communication how we talk to each other you know, our communication, you know, can be rougher. Some of the things that we laugh at, our families are not going to laugh at, <laughs> you know, things that we blow steam off of that, you know, that we see and we come home is like, man, they're not interested. And, or we'll and, be freaked out. Yeah, we'll be freaked out. I say, here's an, here's an example of communication in my own family. You know, Emily has been around the fire service her entire life. Yeah. And at the supper table, Many times a question would be asked by Emily, you know, <laughs> hey, what good calls were you on? <laughs> Our other daughter, Rebecca, she doesn't want to hear anything at all about she that. She her stuff. ears. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she would plug her ears and go, la, 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 like that. But she would say, hey, what'd you guys eat yesterday? <laughs> she was interested in our diet and the culinary aspect of it. So what Emily is saying is, who's your audience? Yeah. Know your audience and listen guys men i'm telling you guys i'm pointing my finger at you you're yelling and screaming and cursing at your wife pull your head out of your rear end that's your wife quit yelling quit screaming quit cursing at her yeah. period the end anything else emily before we wrap up this episode uh, i think that was a good end to the episode of communication <laughs> okay well if you've been following Firehouse Talks with Jersey Rick, you can see that definitely, you know, we don't pull any punches. Not at all. We're going to lay it out there the way it is. We'll speak so, very boldly. Yep. So thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. And until next time, we'll see you later. See you Goodbye. later. <laughs>